want to write a movie, start by writing a comic book. Find out how in today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bluehost. Choosing the right hosting for your online business is critical. Bluehost has reliable servers and beginner-friendly onboarding waiting for you at servermaster.com front slash blue. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now. Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. I never realized the connection between comic books and movies was so tight until I saw a documentary about Joe Dorowski, a director from the 1970s, and how hard he tried to make the movie Dune. I very rarely mention documentaries because I very rarely watch them, but this one was so fascinating. Dune was one of my favorite books as a child. I read the whole series. I even read the continuation of the books as the son took over for the father. Great science fiction series, which you know is the main genre that I read. And what I really found fascinating was that before he made the movie, he created a comic book that showed frame for frame his vision for the movie. And that got me fascinated with the connection between comic books and movies. And as I went through the process of creating the Servant Master graphic novel, which I originally was going to call the Servant Master comic, I learned a whole lot about this process. And I want to share everything with you that took me from idea to fruition. And now that graphic novel is available on the shelves all around the world. When creating a movie or a television show, a big part of the process is called storyboarding. And storyboarding is where you have little drawings of what's going to happen. Now, different directors and Different writers use different amounts of storyboarding. In certain genres, it's more common than others, but the idea is very effective. It's that before you spend tons of money paying for film crews and everything, you have it really drawn out what's going to happen. See, a script, while it's wonderful, you have to describe everything that's going to happen, and sometimes it's not really clear, especially when it comes to the shooting angles and where people are going to be positioned. But you can show so much more information with the drawing. And as someone who grew up reading comic books, I was fascinated with by this visual medium. So there's a great deal of connection. And I began to do research. So, you know, I always start my research on Amazon because it's the largest bookstore. What I found fascinating was that there's so many openings in this genre. There's not a lot of people really going after the comic book space. There's not a lot of great nonfiction comic books. I have read the Book of Five Rings comic book. There was a series for a while that would take classic books and turn them into comic books. And honestly, They got a few things wrong. A few of the examples in their Book of Five Rings comic book didn't match, considering I've read that book a lot of times. That's a book I talk about a lot by Miyamoto Musashi. I've read the fictionalized account of his life. I have read the comic books about Yusagi Yojimbo, which is a rabbit version of the same character. If you used to watch the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoons like I did as a kid, and you saw that rabbit that came through time-traveling episodes, he was based on this same character, Miyamoto Musashi who was the most famous sword fighter in Japanese history, never lost a battle. And he wrote a book about his approach to warfare, which became the basis of my book, Breakthrough. It was all about the five rings. And so I'm really into that philosophy, especially because it's unique, right? Everyone has heard about The Art of War, which is the Chinese book on warfare. Everyone has heard of No Battle Survives First Contact with the Enemy by Clausewitz, who was a Prussian military general, although most people don't enjoy his book. It's quite dry. And then, of course, this is something different. And so I was fascinated. And as I went through this experience, I started to really delve into something that is interesting. And this difference between show me and tell me. Show me, don't tell me is really hard to say. It's hard to explain. And so I'm going to give you a really great example. Recently, this movie came out called um, Birds of Frey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of Harley Quinn. And people either love or hate that movie. For me, when a movie has a lot of voiceover, that's a red flag that it's not a good movie. Nothing else matters. And that movie is about 40% voiceover. You have to fill in the gaps and explain what's happening. That's a sign that they failed because voiceover is almost never in the script. Usually voiceover is something they add in post. They create a whole movie that people watch and go, I can't tell what's happening. And so they add voiceovers. This is how they add those big voiceovers at the beginning of movies. And you'll often hear directors in the commentary saying, oh, we didn't want this voiceover, but the film studio felt like people couldn't understand the movie, so we had to set the scene. And every single scene in Birds of Prey, they have to set up and explain what's happening. That tells you there's a Huge problem because you should be able to see from what's happening on the screen. A better example of this, one of the best examples of show me, not tell me is in the movie World War Z. Whether you love or hate that movie doesn't matter. There's something amazing happens. They show Brad Pitt sitting in a car. He looks out the window 
and he sees a zombie tackle someone. And then the sound changes. They create that sound that's the sound of silence, which is, it goes like, whoa, 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 right? Like they run everything through a filter. And you hear him going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the person on the floor who had just been attacked by a zombie stands up and now they're a zombie. You never hear him say, humans take eight seconds to turn into zombies because you don't need to because he saw it. The visualization in that moment of that movie is so good because you can tell what's happening and you're right there with him. You almost don't even need the sound of him counting to know what's happening. And the reason that doesn't count as voiceover is because he doesn't say what's happening. He just does it. You hear him thinking, you hear him counting in his head and you start counting right along with him because you get it. You go, he's trying to see how long it takes. So that moment is the perfect example of show and tell. It's the opposite of exposition. And that's why that moment in that movie is so perfect. And lots of other movies do this. And if you think about it, how many times have you seen a movie and you wondered why it wasn't good or why you weren't that engaged? If you look back, you'll notice that one of the signs that something's wrong with the movie is that there's way too much exposition or there's a bunch of title cards at the beginning to set the tone. The exception, of course, to all of those is Star Wars. But here's something interesting. My family all hates Star Wars. <laughs> and that's because their exposure is all with the recent ones, with all of like episodes seven, eight, nine. I recently downloaded, uh, we were trying to watch episode nine. I put it on. We had an HD, the whole thing, ready to go. Within the first five minutes, my entire family had left the room. So you might say, oh, that's the exception because that's the one that starts with the scroll. But I actually, there was so much information in that scroll. I was like, ah, it's boring. It's a massive amount of information to set the tone, right? If you watch the original one, episode four, New Hope, where it starts, it goes, oh, the world's at war. Princess Leia is the only hope. Here's, get ready for it, right? That's one thing. This one is like, this person's going here. This person's dead. These people are starting a battle. And actually, I think it was even more than the normal three paragraphs. I think it was four or five. So maybe even the modern exception has started to become the rule that when they have too much exposition or too much title cards at the beginning, it's not a good movie. So between seeing an opportunity in the Amazon marketplace and my fascination after seeing this documentary, I began to think about adapting Servant Master in a comic book. I thought that would be so cool. It started off with the idea of I would love to see a comic book version of myself. Now, this was before the redesign of the website, which now has a bunch of comic book versions of myself. And I went on a really long and arduous journey. And what I learned along the way is that an adaptation is not that easy. A lot of people don't like uh, the second, what do you call it? Um, Harry, I forget what the Harry Potter remakes are called, but it's the second one where it's like Fabulous Beasts and Where to Find Them. The second one, J.K. Rowling wrote the script, and a lot of people don't like that script. I don't know. To me, the, both of those movies, the first two are kind of the same. They're both okay. Not great, but not terrible. But a lot of people really didn't like the second one. And maybe it's, there's an example that people that are great authors are not always great writers. And there are a lot of people who write movies that I listen to and follow some of their podcasts who are really good at adaptations, but have never written anything original. And that's okay because it's a specific skill. I believe adaptation is a unique skill. And as I went through this process, um, I made some mistakes along the way. The first mistake I made was trying to hire someone to make a comic book. If you ever look at the front page of a comic book, there's like 20 names because a lot of people go into that process. I listened to a really, really great interview on a podcast with the man who wrote the comic book, The Coldest City. You might not be familiar with that, but it turned into a Charlie's Theron movie called, oh, something blonde. Not concrete blonde, but uh, not neon blonde, but something like that. It's a Charlie's Theron movie, which I've seen. And he told the whole story of how he went from comic book to movie. And it was really, really interesting. I learned a lot. So I... That's a great episode. I'll actually post a link to that episode in the comments below. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you've seen that movie or you can remember the Charlie's Throne movie that I'm trying to think of, which I should have had in the notes below, just push a thumbs up or leave a comment. Let me know what movie I'm thinking of. And I'll leave a link to that podcast interview, which was really, really good. It was really, really great because he really explained the process. And what I learned from that interview was that he writes a script and then someone else comes in and turns that into a comic book. So he actually writes a script that looks a lot like a movie script. So the script part, writing a comic book is just like writing a movie. It's so close. I was really surprised when I got through this process. Once I first realized I had to split it up and I took down the first job and I said, I'm looking for someone to convert this book into a script. I hired someone who did a fabulous job. Such an amazing job. I was so excited by that story. And he wrote out a script and would say, oh, this page is double pages and this page is one box. This page has three boxes. And he spoke this language that I don't speak, but it was really, really great. And once I had that script and it took him several months, we went back and forth, we did several processes. He had some really good ideas. If you go and grab a copy of the Serve Master graphic novel, and I'll post a link below so that you can grab a copy. You can see it on Amazon or the other bookstores. And sometimes I have promotions where I give it away. Recently, we had a 
a glitch with a live presentation for all the people that had problems connecting. I sent them copies of that to make it up for it because I want to get it out there, but I'm so excited by it. And what you'll notice is that it's in two parts. The first part is a story all about me. And then as I was working with the adapter, the writer, he said, um, this is starting to look a little bit narcissistic. Every panel is a picture of you. How can we tell another story? And we ended up interviewing five people who were followers and had success after reading Serve No Master. And then we created stories or vignettes, like short one act plays about each of them telling their stories. And they were really, really great. They came out really wonderful. And that idea came from the comic book writer. That wasn't my idea. It was a really, really wonderful one. Once he completed the process, it was then time to hire an artist. Now, there's actually a huge delay between these two events. When I first started the process, uh, I didn't know how much it was going to cost. And it ended up becoming quite an expensive proposition. So I put a lot of money to another part of the business. And unfortunately, the comic book pushed to the side because I was really focusing on getting things across the finish line. And then when I had money in the budget again for an artist, I hired an amazing artist, went through a real long process, of course. The other thing I learned is that he said it would take six weeks. It took almost six months to get everything done. Artists really take a long time. And I went through a lot of different ones, but the final product is amazing. The total process cost around $3,000, which is really expensive. Considering that you can get an entire book ghostwritten for about $800 and get it turned around in less than a month, several years and $3,000 is a long investment. And next time I do, it'll be better. What I learned, first of all, is that there are a lot of parts that you can do yourself. There are some really great books. And I'll post some links to some resources below this video and below this podcast episode to some amazing books on how to write comic books. So you can actually learn that. I don't think it's a really hard skill. You just kind of have to learn the structure first, see if you can do it. Learning, oh, I have to write about how many different panels are on the page, the size of the panel, what type of things I have to include. And as I went through the process with the artist, he didn't stick to the original script. It was about 90% the original script, but sometimes he would draw something out. He goes, you know, this doesn't look right. Here's what the original person said, and here's what I think looks better. So we did make some modifications, and in the end, we changed the final page a couple of times, the final message of the book, because we went through a couple of different iterations and ideas before we hit on something perfect. So there is a little bit of room along the process. If you want to control the process, it's important to understand why there was cost overrun for me. The first part of the process was that there are people who are so talented. Some of the people who applied for uh, to write the original script worked for Marvel. They'd worked on some really big name comic books. They'd even worked on some of the movies. And so they had these massive levels of qualifications. I was like, whoa, you're so overly qualified. The guy ended up hiring, really talented, but a little bit newer in the business. And everyone wrote a sample and his was just like, it was so good. It was a little more than I was expecting to pay, but it was totally worth it in the end. We went through the whole process really good. And then the same thing for the artist. The artist I hired during his application process did something really interesting. He sent me an entire page with several different drawings on it. He goes, you know, a lot of people can draw a comic book character. There's a really big difference between doing that and doing a page in a comic book. And so I hired him. Even though he'd never been hired by anyone else on Upwork before I gave him his first job, put all the money escrow, we went to town, and months and months later, we got the book across the finish line, and it came out looking really wonderful. Now, a great question that you might be asking at this point, said, Jonathan, this is interesting, but what's a graphic novel? And that's a really good question because it turns out I didn't know what it was. I've led a lot of things that I thought were graphic novels, but they're not. So here's the difference. A comic book is almost always 24 pages long. I didn't know that until I did research, until I heard this amazing interview about the Cold of City. Additionally, a comic book is a series of stories that end in cliffhangers. So every 24 pages, there's a cliffhanger. That's the structure, and that gets you to read the next issue. And sometimes it's a crossover cliffhanger. So there's story arcs that might be five or six issues. What I've read a lot in the past is like they put together a whole bunch of issues. They take an entire story arc and put it into a book. That's a collection. That's not technically a graphic novel. A graphic novel is a story that is maybe one to 150 pages of comic book and tells a single story with a long story arc. So it's not split up into small parts and it doesn't have a bunch of cliffhangers along the way. So it's written in a slightly different way. Well, it can be a significantly different way. So the man wrote The Cold of City, which is really wonderful, got turned into a movie. He writes a single long story, which has the elements of like a fiction novel, whereas comic books are much more like television series. It's a great way to think of it. You know, I talk about cliffhangers, I talk about the television show 24, because that's the ultimate example and ends in cliffhangers. And that's what a comic book really is. A, ser- a comic book series or a story arc is a bunch of episodes of 24 that keep having cliffhangers. So when I went through my journey, I had no idea what I was doing. But at the end, I finally came out with a product I was proud of. It just took too long, cost more than I was expecting. I didn't really know what I was going to get into. But now knowing when you go in, you can be much more strategic. And you can look at it and go, well, which parts can I do? Which parts I, can I not do? You can create graphic novels where the drawings don't matter. 
I read plenty of comics that look like my kids drew them, but they're very funny, or they use the same image over and over and over again. And there's really cool software out there that can help you with this process where you have a couple of baseline images and you just add text to each one. And you can create the entire thing that way. And what I want to encourage you to do is take some time to look at the process and say, do I want to learn how to write movies? If you want to learn how to write movies, this is a really great bridge because it's so hard to get a movie picked up. It's a massive, arduous process. And movie scripts are quite long. Comic book scripts are actually one third to one half the size in my experience. And you could start by just writing a comic book, 24 pages. That's really manageable. You don't have to go to a full graphic novel. Start with a comic book. And it will really help you to stretch your wings when it comes to blocking out pages and describing how you want things to look. And then when you bring in an artist and you're doing 24 pages, it's way less expensive. Okay, You can get 24 pages done for between $100 and $130. You can get someone for less than $5 a page. Absolutely. Now, if you ask for color pages, the price obviously goes way up. So that's why my comic book's in black and white. Much easier to manage. Maybe the next version I'll do will be in color, but for now, black and white was enough because it would have tripled the cost. Color pages start around $15. And they could certainly go up. There are people who charge $50 to $100 a page. That's if you're really going after the fiction market. Maybe you need to go down that path, but that's not how I do my work. That's not how I did it. I, I try to be cost control. I look for really good talent that's early on in their cycle and it's not as heavily priced. So you can look at these different parts and go, okay, I want to learn how to write movies there. And I listen to a movie writing podcast. I'm very fascinated by the whole process of writing movies. It's how I help myself become a better writer. So I'm on that path with you. And you hear all these stories about people who can never even get anyone to read it. But it's a way to separate yourself and show that you could do something different. It's a way to test your wings. Because so then you send it to the artist. If it comes back looking nothing like you expected, right? Well, then you know something's wrong. And guess what? It's so much easier to get friends, family, and other people to read a comic book than it is to get people to read a script. So it can actually open some doors, and there's some cool marketing things you can do there, which kind of go into kind of my creative networking and marketing strategies, and I'm sharing a little bit with you. But it all starts with this core idea of, let's see if I can write something that someone else can visualize. Because if you don't get it right in the script, if the positioning's not right, if what's happening isn't clear, then it's hard to translate into a movie. And a comic book is a much shorter cycle. There can be years between when you write a script and when you see someone act it out. I listened to a really interesting podcast that's all about scripts that never made it to a table read. There are scripts that got paid for, and then when the network read the final version, they go, you know what, never mind. Keep the money, we're not going to make it. And it's a six to eight month process of creating that script, and they never even heard someone read it out loud, let alone seeing people act it out. So this is a way that you can see in a really short amount of time how your work looks, and then it becomes a cool asset. I'm really excited to have the combo version. I actually think the book is really good. When I first read it, I almost cried because I wish I was as good a writer as the guy who wrote my comic book. I just, I find it so engaging. Now, not everyone's going to love it. Not everyone on my team loves it. But for me, it's something really wonderful. It was a journey that I did first because I like to do new hard things and then I can tell you about them so that you can then try them because there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's not a lot of competition in this market because a lot of people haven't figured it out yet. There's a couple of big players, right? There's like Marvel, DC comic books, and a few other ones that put out, that have all the stuff that even get made into movies. But then in the nonfiction space, in the educational space, in children's comic book space, there's a lot of opportunity, especially if you're willing to be creative and really dig in and see what people are looking for and what's missing. And you can find a space for yourself. And it's something really, really cool. And when you do, please share with me. Post a link to your comic book below. I'll check it out. I would love to check it out and share it with my audience. I want to see you go through this process. I want to see your successes. So please. Take a swing, create a comic book, create a graphic novel, and I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Serve No Master. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more tips and tactics on how to escape that rat race. Head over to servenomaster.com forward slash podcasts now for your chance to win a free copy of Jonathan's bestseller, Serve No Master. All you have to do is leave a five-star review of this podcast. See you Tuesday. Ready to master the art of copywriting? Learn the most valuable online skill without spending a penny at thirdmaster.com front slash ultimate.